Do you spend ages editing a photo in Photoshop only to end up disappointed because the result still feels flat and has no wow factor? And even after using all the best techniques that you've learned from people like me here on YouTube, you're left feeling like your photos still lack that something special. Well, it could be because you're not following three simple editing rules that I've been teaching photographers in my courses and coaching to make their landscapes pop like never before. So in this video, I'll show you step-by-step step in Photoshop what these game-changing rules of editing are and how you can use them to edit amazing images every time. First, let me show you how even the most spectacular scenes with amazing light and color in real life can end up looking flat after we edit them so you know what to stop doing. Because one of the biggest mistakes that photographers make is thinking that you have to enhance absolutely everything, everywhere, all around the entire scene by making color, light, and contrast stand out. But the problem is, when everything stands out, nothing stands out. Now the secret is knowing exactly what to enhance by how much and how to do it so that the whole image appears more three-dimensional because that is what really is gonna make it pop. So to start, let me create a selection around these trees in the foreground of this image. Now I'll run the blur average filter to fill the selection with the average color of all the pixels within this selection. And so now you can see that the average of all these trees is actually quite dark. Now they're in the shade, so you'd kind of expect them to be dark, but these trees over here on the mountain are also in the shade. So should they have the same degree of lightness as their counterparts in the foreground or something different? Let's see. And you can see straight away almost that in the distance, what are effectively the same trees that are also shaded from the sun are actually lighter on average than the ones that are closer to the camera. So why is that? Well, it's because of atmospheric perspective, or in other words, sunlight reflecting off particles in the air between the camera and the stuff off in the distance. So the first rule of editing for depth is to keep this dark light relationship between things in the foreground and things in the background natural. And one of the biggest mistakes I used to make and what I still see others make in editing is eliminating that relationship between dark foregrounds and light backgrounds by, for example, making foreground elements too bright because you're trying to reveal every single detail when really those things should stay relatively dark. Because take a look at what happens to this image when I over brighten these trees. On their own, zoomed in, they don't necessarily look too bright. But zoomed out, they've lost all balance with the rest of the scene and it kind of makes the image look flat. But with that said, that's not the only way that this can go wrong. Check out this image where I made the same mistake. Not only did my original edit, which I made years ago, make the distant mountain too dark, it also failed on the next two rules for editing for depth. And the next one we're gonna talk about is saturation. Because you can see I went ham on the saturation in the mountain and the sky to really try and bring those colors out. And unfortunately, that didn't result in a dynamic landscape with lots of depth and dimension because things in the distance are supposed to be generally less saturated than the same stuff in the foreground. So knowing what I know now, I re-edited this photo from scratch, keeping in mind depth throughout the process, and this was the result. Now it's much more natural looking in three-dimensional. Now I'll actually show you a breakdown of this complete edit from start to finish later in the video, but first, rule three for editing for depth and dimension. While rules one and two cover lightness and saturation differences between foreground and background elements, the third part of this trifecta is contrast. Contrast generally drops off further you go into the distance, again, because of atmospheric perspective. So with that said, let me show you some practical tips for editing for depth and dimension with a breakdown of my re-edit for this old Mount Cook photo. All right, so here we are in Photoshop and we're looking currently at the finished edit for this image. So what I'm gonna do now is strip back all of these edits that I've got and we're gonna step through and look at how I've modified each section of the image based on these groups and I'll show you the edits that I made to do them and where it might be helpful to actually show you how I made each edit, then I'll do that as well. So, you know, some of these edits are pretty simple curves, levels, adjustments, just masked into the image. Just for example, this one here, edit number one is just a curves adjustment that darkens the image, slightly boosts the reds. And then you can see I've just masked it into the foreground. So the purpose of this is to start darkening the foreground because in terms of maintaining depth or enhancing depth, I decided I wanted to darken the foreground based on the rules that we discussed in the earlier section of the video. So step number one was to darken the foreground. Step two here, I've done some very light dodging and burning using a colored brush to just highlight 
some of these trees in here. So if I toggle this layer off and on, you can see that just gets a little bit lighter and that light has a little bit of warmth to it. And the technique for that is to simply add a new empty layer, stick the blend mode on overlay, and then with the brush tool, I'll hold alter option and sample a light color from the sky or somewhere up here. And so we have this kind of peachy pinky color. And on a lowish opacity, I'll, I'll use like a higher opacity so you can see the difference it makes. But you can just sort of brush into the image and dodge with that color being applied at the same time. So it gives a nice blended effect rather than just using a white brush to dodge. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's the idea. So I've done that a little bit more subtly than I just did now and I've masked it into the shadows. Now, if you're familiar with luminosity masking already, then you'll understand what that means. If not, then long story short, using the brightness of the pixels in the image, we can create a mask that restricts a layer or an adjustment to a specific tonal range. For example, the dark areas or the bright areas. Now I've used my luminosity masking panel to create that luminosity mask. If you want to get a free version, then there's a link in the description and pinned comment. And also if you want to get the paid version, which has got a lot more features, then sign up for the free version. And on the immediate next page, there'll be a special offer where you can get the full paid version along with my luminosity masking course for a special discount. So the way that works though, assuming we're using the paid version, is this bar at the top that's got these numbers on it, minus five through to five. When we click each one of these buttons, it's gonna preview a luminosity selection slash mask. So let's say we wanted to apply an adjustment just into the shadows. We can do that by selecting any one of these shadows luminosity selections. So a minus five is gonna give us the darker shadows in the image. And now if we wanna use this as a layer mask, we just hit load as selection to load it as a selection. And then we can add a adjustment layer that has a layer mask with it. For example, curves adjustment like this. So now we can brighten and darken just the shadows. Or if it's a regular layer and we haven't added a layer mask to it, at the point that we add the layer mask, that's when the luminosity selection gets added to the layer mask. So that's what I've done here. And then I just brushed with a black brush out of the sky because I didn't need anything happening up there. So uh, yeah, this is just being masked into the shadows in the foreground very subtly. Um, so like I said, that's a very quick overview of how the luminosity masking works. I've got heaps of other videos that describe this in more detail if you're new to the idea. But yeah, let's let's proceed on. The last task I did here in the foreground was just to add a little bit more dodging to those trees and a little bit over here on the left hand side. So that's the foreground. So here's before, here's after. And already you can see how just the general focus of the image goes away from the foreground. And it's like our view is being pulled more towards the mountain. All right, let's load up the next set of adjustments. And it looks like there's a lot here. It's really only because I've separated the same kind of adjustment across a lot of different areas. Uh, so really, this is all a lot of dodging and burning and general brightening and darkening. So if I just peel these adjustments back and just really quickly walk you through what each one does. So here, I've just used the curves adjustment to slightly darken the sky there while adding a bit of contrast. And I've masked it into the sky, partially using the luminosity mask, so you can see the effect of that. This one here is basically the opposite. So what I wanted to do with this one is, is brighten the base of the mountains so that we actually have more contrast between them and the tops of these trees. So if I toggle this off and on, you can see suddenly with it being lighter behind the trees and the trees remaining dark, that suddenly becomes more of a visual pull as well because it's a higher contrast now. And it also creates more separation between the foreground and the background. Here, this is, it's kind of a funny way of uh, increasing saturation in the image. So I've got a uh, curves adjustment that sort of darkens the image, but when we change the blend mode of the layer, or the adjustment to color, 
then what we see the effect becoming is essentially a saturation of the colors in the sky and I've masked it just into the sky there. So, so far we've darkened the sky, brightened the base of the mountains, increased the saturation in the sky. This layer here, I've done a bit more dodging just in the foreground. Over here, I've now started to burn some of these mountains in between the foreground and the background. So these are sort of middle distance mountains. You can't really tell from here because they all appear the fairly sort of similar tonal ranges. So by darkening this one on the right and then darkening this one on the left, again, we've, we've created a little bit of separation between these ones and then the Mount Cook that's in the background in the distance. So that's just some simple dodging, which I've masked in just to make sure it doesn't sort of the effect doesn't go over the edges of where I want to uh, apply it. Here we've enhanced or brightened just the base of Mount Cook there. Here we've done it again, just really, you know, the reason I do this across many adjustments is exactly for this reason that I'm showing you now, you know, you can separate things out and if we want to undo or change one, then we don't have to delete all of our work on a particular layer. If I'd done all this dodging and burning on one layer, then I got something wrong. I would have to undo the whole thing. This adjustment here, what I decided to go for was if we just look over on the left, Again, the idea of looking for an edge that has contrast and then enhancing the contrast. So uh, this adjustment here, I've, I've brightened the light side of this V shape in here. So you can see in doing that, it makes that line pop more. And again, because that's a higher contrast edge now and it pops more. Uh, so this one here is a burn layer again. So we're just burning this bottom left corner. I decided that was a little bit too bright and just pulling too much attention right into the corner of the frame. This adjustment here is a very simple, almost a vignette, you know, uh, or the opposite of a vignette. I brightened the middle by pushing a curve up slightly and then just masking it in with a big soft brush just into the middle there to again, lighten the distance to uh, make that more of the focal point. This adjustment here, we've just darkened the top of the sky and the bottom of the foreground just a little bit. Let's turn this set of adjustments off and on a couple of times so we can see the overall effect. And yeah, things are definitely starting to stand out more and pop and we haven't really changed too much. You know, it doesn't feel like crazily different even to the raw file apart from the foreground, you know, very subtle adjustments, but it's just creating areas of separation, creating depth and layering by choosing what we're going to brighten and darken based on those rules that we spoke about earlier. So the next group of adjustments is again, a pretty small one, but this is some dodging and some burning and then just a hue saturation layer. Now, again, that same idea of, of brightening the area behind the mountains, you know, uh, if I toggle this off for a second, yeah, here it's a very similar tonal range between the mountain and the sky behind. There's not much definition or separation between them. So I've just slightly lightened the sky behind and then I've burned the top of the uh, ridge line here. So darkened the near side of those mountains. And then together, you can see that just makes that contrast line pop a little bit more relative to each other without necessarily massively increasing the, the actual total dynamic range of that area uh, and then yeah this adjustment here is just a hue saturation i think i've just boosted the saturation just to bring a bit of color back in there and this final set of adjustments is really just sort of finishing the image off just giving it a little bit more pop your mileage may vary or your tastes may vary but a uh, funny story just before i hit record I asked my partner, Sonia, what she thought of this as a finished edit. And she said, the sky looks dirty. So fair enough. Um, you know, and then looking at it from, uh, you know, like a thumbnail view, I can kind of see where she's coming from because the sky, the blues don't quite do it for me there. You know, just the way the clouds are. I don't know. There's something, you know, the blues don't quite look right. They, they're just, yeah, yeah. I, I get where she's coming from. So what I've done here, I've, added some contrast into the sky. So that's a, a highlights luminosity mask that I've then just brushed out of the foreground manually. So I've just increased the contrast to bring a bit more saturation in there and see what happened to the 
to the blues. I figured if we can get some more blue into the blue parts of the sky, then that might help, but I don't want it to look oversaturated. Yeah, then I thought, well, what if we just go for a total highlight warming effect? So I've done that with a solid color layer set to the overlay blend mode and again masked just into the highlights. This is always a good finisher to try. Um, and I thought that looked really nice actually. Again, this is one of those things you might not like it yourself, but for me, warming the highlights right at the end of an edit, it can often just give you an image, a little bit of pop. Um, but then still the sky, just the way the thin pink clouds just blend against the blue sky still looks a bit mushy to me. So I've basically brightened the shadows, so the bluey parts and the... Uh, Actually, was this a shadows? No, let me think. So this is the luminosity mask anyway. So yeah, it's it's brightening the darker blue parts of the sky, as you can see there. And it sort of makes those blues a bit more pastely and just feels a little, a little less dirty in, in Sonia's words. So um, yeah, let's let's uh, look at this in, in the small sort of thumbnail view. It looks it does pop a lot more to me now. You definitely get a sense of the distance and the depth and the feeling of the scene. The sky, the sky looks a lot better than than it did before these last three edits. I think if I toggle these off and on a couple of times just to see that in review. Um, but comparing it to the before version, so this is the raw file coming straight into Photoshop. You know, for me, this this is a transformation I quite like. Now, let's compare it to the. Uh, the original edit I made years and years ago when I first took this shot, which to me, I don't know, maybe some people like this. I mean, at one point, I obviously thought this looked good, um, but yeah, not not for me anymore. Um, the sky is way too saturated, way too dark in comparison to the stuff in the foreground. Even these trees, I've, I've over brightened them like we talked about earlier. But anyway, yeah, going back from from here, which just looks, it's like punch you in the face, saturated. On first switch, our new edit might look a little bit less exciting, but I don't know. I think, you know, just seeing this in isolation, you know, once you kind of cleanse your palette of those overly garish saturated colors, I think this one looks a lot better. It has a lot more depth. And by definition, it just pops more in a good way compared to the other one. So as you can see, luminosity masking plays a massive part in my end-to-end -end editing workflow. And I've made it easier by creating my free luminosity masking plugin for Photoshop if you're new to the subject. So click the link below this video if you want to download that for free or watch this next video to see how transformational luminosity masking can be for your photography.